Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. UKIP, without whom there would never have been a referendum on the EU, began the descent to tragedy, then farce, almost immediately, the morning after, the night before, their finest hour. But this is surely their darkest hour. The disgraceful conduct of their leader, Henry Bolton, deserting his wife and two young babies and running off with a 25-year-old glamour model was only the start of it. When the glamour model was caught in possession of the very ugliest racist views even about the royal family, UKIP and even Henry Bolton had to ditch her, although he is still being photographed with her despite the trouble she's caused. Getting on for a score of UKIP spokespeople have resigned rather than serve under Bolton, and the national executive of the party voted unanimously that he should demit office. With the exception of Bolton himself, he still has full confidence in Henry Bolton, so he stayed put, at least at the time of recording. Extraordinarily, Bolton has, though, secured the support of the only kipper who really matters, Nigel Farage, who has denied earlier reports that he and Aaron Banks, both former guests on this show, intend to set up a new kip to put the government's feet to the fire on Brexit. We couldn't reach either Farage or Banks, but we've got the next best thing. The rising star writer and investigative journalist for Westminster, Patrick Christie's, who knows what's going on in their hood. Patrick, thanks for joining us. Let's have me on. The, uh, the situation could hardly be more farcical. Uh, the largest shadow cabinet in British history yeah. has all now... <laughs> it's disintegrated, hasn't it, really? Resigned. Yes. The executive has voted, with the exception of Bolton himself, that Bolton should go. He said he's staying on, making an extraordinary general meeting necessary. Is it not time to... Wrap UKIP up. Well, it's interesting. We're kind of watching a political party eat itself in full view of the electorate here, aren't we? You know, I think the, the issue is as long as your leader's love life is splashed all over the press and that leader seems unable to move the story on from that, then you've got problems. And then again, the way that the party has gone about this, stories of the leaking things to the press and things like that, is becoming less and less electable by the day, isn't it? And their challenge now, the only way I believe that they could keep going as a party is to move this narrative forward, start holding the government's feet to the fire on Brexit, because they've not been there on some of these big issues so far. As long as their vote base can see that they are big on Brexit, that they are pushing forward things like the end to free movement of people, or when are we starting going to get control of our judiciary back and things like that, then maybe they could maintain a, a certain amount of votes. But at the minute, it's looking a bit dicey, I think. It does. And if he stays on, let's say he won the mm. uh, extraordinary well, I think, general I think meeting, he possibly would. Which, with uh, Farage's support, he probably would. Yeah. You've then got a deeply damaged leader uh, with all his shadow cabinet resigned, mm. uh, carrying on into the future. Uh, it seems to me untenable. But I often think to myself, do I really know what's going on here? Because this cannot be all an accident that a party fell apart right after its great victory mm. so very quickly. Have you got any dark suspicions about that? I think there's been people that have, have, have said maybe he's a, a Lib Dem plant because of obviously he's had ties to the Liberal Democrats. No, I don't think there's anything dark going on here personally. You're at talking all. about uh, uh, Henry Bolton. 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 Yeah, well, that's yeah. what I wonder as well. How pro Brexit is he really? Well, what, no, what do I, we know? Of I him? mean, my, I, I have met him. Obviously, I've interviewed him several times. I've had no indication whatsoever anything other than he is a staunch Brexiteer and that he does want out of the European Union. I think the problem that he's got is that he's not articulated that. Mm. You know, he's, he's not come out fighting on things. We've seen things that he could and should have picked apart with the government. There's 44.5 billion to Calais, for example, maybe with regards to the Brexit bill, the fact that free movement of people could be extended now for another couple of years. And he's been silent on it. So I can see why people maybe have these suspicions. I don't think they're found. He uh, may go on may win the vote 
if he doesn't, I mean, is there anyone left that could well, credibly so, challenge for the leadership? Some of, some of the people that resigned aren't even household names in their own home, are yeah. they? You know, so <laughs> I think that's a bit tricky. I, I, I honestly don't know. I think that if he were to go, UKIP is, is in big trouble. There needs to be a political voice at the minute in British politics mm. that is filling this void that there is. You know, the Tories are all at sixes and sevens when it comes to Brexit. We're being led into Brexit by, by a Remainer, aren't we? And obviously the civil service are behind her pulling the strings. I mean, they don't like radical change at all. They obviously are not going to really be in favour of pushing through a clean Brexit. Labour's itself divided. UKIP should be filling that void, as I've said, and it's exactly. not. And so if Bolton goes and there's a, a, some kind of more furore with the UKIP party, another election, this, that and the other, there's still this gap there in British politics yeah. and some, maybe it is time for a new movement or a new party to fill well, that I void. I ask that next because, I mean, truthfully, as I said in the introduction, UKIP was Nigel Farage. Mm. If not for Farage and UKIP by extension, there would never have been a referendum. Therefore, we wouldn't be Brexiting. Yet, Farage has, for personal reasons, uh, retired from the battlefield. Mm. And he hasn't been replaced, maybe can't be replaced. So Possibly. can't you draft him back in? <laughs> but he's well, neither one thing or the other because he didn't completely retire. Now he, you know, he even he backed. Henry mm. Bolton, for example. Why yes. did he do that? So well, when, he's still when, in the public when, eye because he's got a radio show. Yes, I understand, uh, but, to, you but know, he's not party related. He's, he's not uh, actually in as a full-time politician mm. anymore. Well, these are, these are obviously decisions for Nigel with regards to what, what, he, what his next move is. He is, as you've said, in the political game. I think the main point is that at the minute there are 17.4 million Brexiteers in Britain that are not being not adequately represented. represented. Mm. And that's a huge problem because we've had a democratic vote here, we've had a referendum, people can argue about who knew what when they took the vote slip. I, I don't buy into that. I think people knew, knew what they were voting for. And we are at risk in this country now of democracy being subverted because no one's holding the government's feet to the fire. And so whether it is Nigel or someone else, I, I, I don't know, but there, does, there is space in British society and in the political landscape for some new movement, and it, it needs it for the sake of democracy, Well, there's no say. doubt uh, that it needs it and that it could prosper because the uh, Brexit that we're going to get, not just from the Remain-led government, and there's speculation uh, this week that Boris Johnson is going to be either mm. sacked or leave, uh, which would make their commitment to Brexit yeah. even less uh, than it is. So either the Tories will not actually try and deliver the Brexit that people mm. voted for, or if they do, the House of Commons, still more the House of Lords, will vote it down. And therefore that void you talk about, that vacuum, is going to loom massively in British politics. And very soon, well, we're only talking about next year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the British electorate won't forgive people if they don't try to fill that void. If, there's, if they can see that their will is not being fulfilled, as unfortunately you see all too often in Westminster, the will of the people doesn't seem to ever make it onto the Commons floor. And if they see that there was an opportunity here and no one stepped up to the plate and spoke for them and spoke for the people that take that or cross that leave box, they could lose faith in the whole political system if, if they haven't already. And I really do think it's, it's necessary now. And as I've said before, the only way I think UKIP will survive is if it does make steps to fill that void. Stops getting bogged down in this internal shambles, this kind of amateurish approach that it seems to be taking at the minute, and actually gets to grips and holds the government's feet to the fire on these issues. So I was talking about controlling free movement of people and, and ending it quite quickly. I was talking about what we're going to do they with our call followers. They call it, uh, Patrick, well, you see, <laughs> They call it free movement. I know you call it so cold. And that, uh, that, that uh, really irks me because yeah. it's not free movement of people. It's free movement of cheap East and Central European and labour. It. Flooding the labour market in Britain, driving down wages, as the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell finally. finally acknowledged uh, on Sunday, something I've been saying for years and being called a lot of bad Absolutely. names for doing so, uh, driving down wages, driving up rents and so on. There'll still be free movement of people in that you and I can go to Torre Molinos Absolutely. for our holiday. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> He's taking me on it. If they'll pay us. And the French will still come here and go to Henley Regatta and so Absolutely. on. I mean, it's the idea that we're talking of siege Britain yeah. uh, has been very carefully 
fostered. So uh, whilst the Brexit camp ha has got no proper representation, mm. the Remain side has got figures like Tony Blair coming up. Well, Are gosh, you yeah. what, what do you think of that? Well, obviously, I mean, I think, as I think you've said yourself, if Tony Blair's in favour of anything, then I, then I personally am dead against it. I mean, <laughs> I, I think... I don't think he should be still... have any kind of voice whatsoever. He should be widely discredited, Only in my opinion. Uh, we, we, we like to hear him speak <laughs> from the dock <laughs> in, the, in the hate. Absolutely. But Gayatri's on to something, isn't she? The, the, the Remainers have got a majority in Parliament almost all of the civil service, the deep state, the BBC, the CBI, if it still exists, yeah. the city of London, big capital and so on, against the people, 17.4 million people, the biggest number who ever voted in Britain for anything in all of our history. It's an unequal battle in one way. It's, it's we are many, they are few, but they've got a lot of big guns. And this is it. And unless you start having a voice, unless you start having some kind of movement and things, it may, it's, you're at risk of it looking like you're running scared. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Nigel Farage came out and muted the idea of a second referendum. I know he, he said he didn't particularly want mm -hmm. one, but he raised the idea of it, because otherwise it looks like the only people calling for a second referendum are the Remain yeah. camp. Yeah. It makes the Leavers look I've like... I've on that. It, right, I think we should do it. And it makes them look like they're scared. And, and the, the Leave camp have nothing to be scared of from a second referendum. I think we'd wipe the floor with yeah. them, absolutely. How could anyone in their right minds now, having seen Martin Schultz call for the United States of Europe by 2020, Jean-Claude Juncker call for an EU army fronted by himself, obviously, how could anyone <laughs> vote remain? Field Marshal Juncker, yeah. so, what could possibly abso go wrong? Absolutely, you know, so really, how could anyone in their right minds now vote for remain? The margin, the only question of a second referendum would be what margin the Leave side wins by. Mm. And we, people need to be going on the front foot now, because otherwise, as you rightly said, it's only people like you, Tony Blair's of this world that have a voice, and they shouldn't. Well, Westminster, uh, for which you write, and in the interests of full disclosure, I should say I also write a, a column there, uh, is just about the only pro-Brexit site that in the, in the whole of Britain, so far as <laughs> I... People go. say to me, why do you write for Westminster? <laughs> I say, because nobody else that has a, a, a website or a publication is supporting that uh, point of view. So the very best of luck. Thank you you're, very much. Uh, you're all over the media these days. Very impressive young man. Thank I haven't you. seen a more impressive 26-year-old since I was uh, 26. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick got a lot to live up to. Thank thanks you. for joining us on The Sputnik. The Godfather is in the house. After a break, don't miss it. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Without the windy city of Chicago, there would have been no house music. And without our next guest, Marshall Jefferson, nobody outside of Chicago would ever have heard of it. I was moving my body just this morning to the Jefferson masterpiece by the same name. Ghetto house, acid house, deep house, Chicago house, these were the genres which swept the world from the 1980s and nowhere more aesthetically than in England, where at clubs in Nottingham and Manchester, house music really got a grip. So much that its godfather, Marshall Jefferson, stayed on in the haciendas of Manchester. The godfather is in the house. Respect to you, Respect Marshall to you. Jefferson. Great of you to come on board the Sputnik, just for the benefit of older viewers, or younger viewers for that matter. How do you define house music? Uh, house music is the coolest underground dance music. And it could be anything. That's what a lot of people don't understand. But it's the best, coolest underground dance music. You could tell it when you hear it. Um, some of your goofy pop stuff could never be house, but some of your cooler pop stuff can be house. If it's cool, it's house. But it was urban. It came from, from the working class, from the, from the poor, independent. It came from, it came from uh, well off. Uh, too. It's a, uh, it's, it doesn't matter where it, it comes from. I mean, there, there were a lot of us in the beginning. Uh, Steve Silk, Hurley, Chip E, Joe Smooth, Farley, Jack Master Funk. A lot of us uh, came from different backgrounds. A lot, some of us weren't so poor. You know, some of us were poor, but some of us uh, were well off. But what uh, a common thing was, people wanted to dance. And uh, what happened was Chicago had a very serious gang problem. 
and uh, rap wasn't working for us. I mean, it, it wasn't an option because the gangsters would come out. So we found out, we quickly found out that if we play European music, uh, you know, or, or even or new wave uh, and stuff like that, that the gangsters wouldn't come that come to those uh, gatherings. They they wanted to hear James Brown and Parliament Funkadelic. They they liked the funky stuff, and we, you know, so we were kind of anti-funk <laughs> in anti the beginning for the okay. for anti the discerning gangster. For the discerning your music gangster. Was well, too sophisticated. If we do, if we did, uh, if. They knew we played divine, you know, or something like that. No, I ain't going there, you know. But if we, if it, we, we were playing people, pop, 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 you know, the gangsters would get there and they start shooting up the place. Was it significant that it emerged from Chicago? Was there a reason for that? Uh, well, the reason was. We started making records out of nowhere. I mean, uh, this guy named Jesse Saunders. He start he. Jesse Saunders and Vince Lawrence, they pressed up a record called On and On. And uh, I heard that record, and within minutes, I said, oh, I'm going to make records too. And it was, that one, it was that one song that got everybody started. Because uh, I was just a DJ, and the, the furthest thing from my mind was making music, you know, making records. I, you know, I was just DJing at home. And what happened was, I said, oh, I'm going to make records too. I got to figure out how to do it. Coincidentally, a friend of mine needed a lift to a music store called Guitar Center in Chicago. So I, I, I'll drive you there. I worked at the post office. I had a nice car. So I took, took him to a uh, guitar center. And the guy, the salesman, he said, I have this new thing called a QX1. With this Q, Yamaha QX1 sequencer, you can play keyboards like Stevie Wonder, even if you don't know how to play. I said, wow. Yeah, you know, that's what I need, right? So I, I, how much is he? He said, three, three grand. So I don't have that much. This is early 80s, yeah? This early 80s. And he said, and said, well, where do you work at? I said, the post office. He said, oh, well, we'll give you a credit line. They gave me a $10,000 credit line. Oh. So I said, oh, well, I'll get the QX1 now. He said, wait a minute. You can't, uh, you got the sequencer. Now you need a keyboard to play. Right? Because the sequence is the keyboard. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. right? So I bought the keyboard, right? And he said, you know, what do you want to do this? I want to, I want to make records. I said, oh, you need a drum machine. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. Right? So How was so, your 10,000 gone? Yeah, well, I bought, got the drum machine. Right? And he said, oh, you know what? You need a mixer so you can hear everything at the same time. I said, well, I got a DJ mixer. He said, no, you need a recording mixer. I said, yeah, you're right. I need a recording mixer. Right? So I bought the recording mixer. And he says, uh, you need a, something to record it on, on. You need a multi-track recorder, right? So I had this thing called a Tascam Port One. Said, yeah, I'll get that too, right? And, uh, you know, then he had this little thing he couldn't, he sold it to me for $150 called TB303, right? So it's, oh, yeah. And he said, you can make bass lines. But he said, yeah, I want to make bass lines. That's right. So got that too, right? So came home and, uh, you know, uh, my my friends came over and said, "Oh, stupid fool! Fool! He bought all this stuff and he doesn't even know how to play." And they took the when black people take the <laughs> out of you in the states. I mean, it, oh, you feel <laughs> like you're this tall. You know, like, about five hours they were laughing at me. I said, "Oh, this is the worst, right?" But I wrote my first song two days later, and about another year later. Uh, I had the song out called Move Your Body. And I was listening to it this morning. DJs were hot, started hiring keyboard players and telling them to play piano like Marshall Jefferson. Wow. <laughs> See, this is why they call you the Godfather of House. That's uh, great. Could, so from that guitar center yeah. and that $10,000 credit line yeah. for a whole lot of stuff you didn't know how to operate, you became this world iconic figure in that genre of music. It's an amazing so, story. Uh, I was inspired by Led Zeppelin and Elton John. Now, and you also uh, worked with Tom Jones, didn't you? Worked with Tom Jones on his album, uh, The Lead and How to Swing It. Yes. And, uh, yeah. I did this song called uh, Love is on Our Side, and uh, which was later covered by Sonique on her gold album. Wow. So, so he said, 
I mean, you wouldn't think of Tom Jones with house music. Is that compatible? Is that, well, does that work? Except I know something you don't know. To recording next door to them was, le uh, was, was Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, the Page Plant Project. Yep. And Tom told you that Jimmy Page played session guitar for him in the 60s. You see, that, <laughs> two separations from, uh, from greatness. This, this is extraordinary that Jimmy yeah. Page played with Tom, and Tom took you through to meet your heroes. Uh, yeah. Now, really uh, you said there was a gang problem in Chicago then when you started. Yeah. There certainly is now. Well, uh, that's from Is that why you're living in Manchester? <laughs> uh, no, well, part of the, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but, uh, the, the problem started in the seventies with the police. My fa father was a policeman at the time. And, uh, um, I also had black Panthers in my family. Mm. What happened was the leader of the black Panthers, Fred Hampton tried to unite the gangs in Chicago you know, for good reasons. He wanted black unity, and uh, he would go to the ghetto in the projects and wake everybody up at 6 in the morning and have them doing calisthenics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the police, they just say, hey, we got to, you know, we got to... got to Break this up. Yeah, we got to break this up. We, so so uh, they... they they put all the gang leaders in, and uh, they killed Fred Hampton in his sleep. Yeah. Uh, my cousin uh, Bobby Rush took over the Black Panthers after Fred Hampton was killed, and well, he's a politician now. He's he became a congressman, and now he's a senator. But uh, he was. But uh, so I had Black Panthers in my family, and I also had my father was a policeman, and uh, and what happened was by you know, breaking up all the gang leadership, none of the gangs have had leadership since. It used to be you could go to, like, the neighborhood gang leader and talk to him and say, you know, my father would always do it because he was a cop. He'd say, hey, can you tell this guy to chill and, you, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and defuse the situation. Now the situation is you have a different gang on every block. Yep. So you walk one block over and there's shooting going on, you know. And that it's been like that for, like, the last 50, you know, almost 50 years. So that's why in Chicago we don't, you know, for partying, we, you know, they say, Kanye West coming to town next week. Kanye West concert canceled because of lack, due to lack of sales, even though he's from Chicago. He, he knows it. That's because they know, you know, somebody's going to smuggle a gun up in there and start shooting. You know, <laughs> don't, we don't like rap in Chicago for that reason. In you the were a 70s. victim yourself uh, of crime in Chicago, no? I've been robbed three times. <laughs> you know, me and my friend Chauncey Alexander, we were, you know, we went out with these women uh, for like two and a half hours, and uh, we got back, and the entire house was cleaned out. Uh, up, upstairs, uh, downstairs, and everything, even carpets. Even carpets. Even were carpets were, were, were taken, right? So. You know, Charles, oh, they took all my stuff. They took everything. I, you know, I, I said, well, you have to admit it was a really efficient job. You know, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, golly, we, we're only gone like two and a half, two and a half hours. The whole house was cleaned out. Now, you know, I didn't know how somebody was that efficient to do that. And, and uh, I found out two years later it wasn't efficient at all. Uh, one of my friends said, yeah, man, that was... That's the whole neighborhood that took your, took your stuff. I said, huh? I said, yeah, man, it, we just walked in and took what we wanted and stuff. I said, man, y'all must have really hated me to do something. They said, no, you, we love you. You're the pride of the neighborhood. We, you know, you just had stuff we wanted. You know, everybody <laughs> just walked. You know, he wanted the TV. He wanted your, he wanted your keyboard, beds and everything. Oh, you know, my said, God. Oh. Just as well, your $10,000 credit line has been extended many times uh, since. Oh, man. Marshall, oh. it's been an honor to have you <laughs> on board the Sputnik. <laughs> And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So do you think that this will be the last we see of UKIP? I mean, they couldn't get any lower, right? Thomas Runeo says, 
not when the BBC are infatuated with Nigel Farage. And USD says UKIP is done. No members, no money. They got the referendum. It's time to pack up. And Mark Andrews says they will be absorbed into the Tory party. No problem. Well, I certainly think you should stand by for a dramatic new development. Uh, UKIP is dead. Long live new <laughs> KIP. New KIP in one form or another isn't going to go away. Well, let's see about that. So that's all the time we've got for the tweets today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today, or on Twitter and Instagram, RT underscore Sputnik. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.